Greetings, friends. My name is Justin McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. Quite often on Blueprints, we talk about the limitations of Canadian electoral politics, of, of liberal democracies. And with all the issues we've raised so far and all the inequities we still haven't even touched on, I think it's easy to realize the level of change we need will require something we've just never seen here in Canada. The big question is always, how do we get there? Right now, consensus seems to be that the socioeconomic conditions, the political atmosphere in Canada isn't at the point it needs to be. In truth, Canada has not seen the level of political engagement and collective mindset required to push outside these confines of our so-called democracy, you know, outside of what we think is possible. So it's been a long time since the working class have made any significant gains. In our last interview, John Clark reminded us that the courage to meaningfully disrupt the system must come from the base from the rank and file. We've acknowledged many times on here that the need to have organized labor work hand in hand with social movements to mobilize the population so we can activate that collective power we keep talking about. And it's true. If we keep looking to Canadian examples, we are going to have a hard time building something new. We are likely doomed to just keep repeating the same patterns, working within the same confines. But if we look outside this very limited scope, right, if we examine movements which have been successful, we can start to make the necessary foundations for that revolution. So in this episode, we are going to look at South American social movements, a cursory look that honestly ends up asking more questions than it answers. But this is a good thing because... We are going to use this episode, as well as some of the other themes that have been a constant in our work here, as a launch point for a mini-series. To start this larger discussion, Santiago and I talked to Alexander Maldivan about his recent experience studying social movements while in Venezuela. He shares some inspiring stories of resistance and solidarity, as well as historical context to help put it all in perspective. The North... And South American experiences certainly have their differences. We recognize that, but there are so many parallels as well, and even more lessons to be learned. So we're excited at the idea of exploring this further with you, the audience. If you'd like to support us as we expand their content, our work, please consider becoming a patron of the show. As we go through the interview, you'll actually hear Santiago and I come to the realization that our work here, drawing lessons from the South American experience, is far from done. So you can also help us by listening in as we start this discussion and share with us any themes or questions you'd like us to explore moving forward. Here's our interview with Alex. Okay, welcome, Alex. Can you please introduce yourself for the audience? Thank you. Thank you for having me, Justin Santiago. Uh, my name is Alexander Moldovan. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, So I'm a PhD student at York University in the Department of Politics. I study kind of the link between social movements, insecurity, and self-defense. I've been looking at this for several years. Uh, I've just come back from fieldwork in in Venezuela, where I had the chance really to learn over the the course of about two months from movements kind of down there, uh, organizations and committees that have formed to free uh, imprisoned workers, farmers who, who are trying to feed cities in, in, in uh, one of the worst kind of situations of food insecurity in the, the hemisphere, uh, and workers who have taken over their factories. Um, although, like, my background is European, I was born and raised here in Canada, um, you know, I, I strive to learn from, from movements abroad. And let's face it, I mean, Canadian politics tends to be a, a bit boring. We, we joke that it's cold up here and nothing happens, but... Um, you know, we've, we've seen titanic shifts in our political landscape. Um, you know, an almost attempted, I guess, uh, move to overthrow the government in earlier this year that we're hearing the inquiry about very recently. Um, so there's, there's certain things that I feel that we can definitely learn from the Venezuelan experience. Pushing back against the far right, that's definitely a useful tool. And it, it's what you said is kind of in part why we 
called you on to Blueprints when you mentioned that you had been studying social movements in South America, it seemed like a perfect time to talk about it because a lot of our episodes have been with the frustration in Canadian politics, the stagnation on the left. You're talking about movements on the right. You know, that's not much to get excited about, but I understand what you're you're talking about like a, a need for for mobilization but hopefully through this discussion i'm hoping to learn a lot because when we were talking to dimitri lascaris right santiago's here with us today um because he's got a lot of value to add to this conversation as well so yeah i'm hoping to soak up a lot of knowledge for you from the both of you but also as a broader movement here in Canadian activism on any parallels that you could draw or lessons that we can learn as activists on how to make way, to use social movements to make way for actual progressive government. Um, Because I think a lot of people right now are at a loss without a political home. We've talked about this a lot on Blueprints and our encouragement has for folks to take up activism and to do mutual aid and things in their community to help push their neighbors left, you know, to kind of put it roughly. But we're not there yet, right? We're definitely not there yet. I don't feel like we could activate civil society in the same way in South America. But maybe maybe you're going to give us a little bit of hope there, Alex, because you sounded a little hopeful there in your intro. Santiago, what do you hope to get out of this conversation? Well, for me, the way I see it right now, the whole world, you're seeing a push to the right. You know, you're seeing far right movements grow in Canada, the United States. Italy elected a fascist government. You have uh, all over Europe, the far right is gaining more and more traction. Really, there's not been a lot of victories for the left. And then I look at Latin America and I see the opposite story, right? We're living pink tide part two, you know? A country like Colombia, my home country where I was born, which had never elected anybody even remotely close to being a leftist, that had been one of the strongest allies of the United States in Latino America, that has to this day the most U.S. bases in the continent, that has been a brutally violent place for leftists to organize, elected its first leftist president. That is a strong contrast to what we're seeing here. And I guess for me, being having lived in Canada so long now and doing all of my activism in Canada, I want to figure out, you know, what is it that they're doing right there? What is it? How are these movements being formed? When so many of us are talking, for example about writing off electoralism here, about exploring avenues outside of electoralism. How is it that they're finding victories through electoralism? How is it that they're finding victories outside of it as well? Because there's a lot of organizing going on outside of that. I don't necessarily have the answers, but... And I don't even know if we can (laughs) even... Maybe Alex has all the answers. Isn't that why we brought him here? Oh, God, no. (laughs) No pressure. But that is a conversation I think that we have to start having, right? And it's worth learning because, I mean, they're doing something, you know, something's going well. No, certainly. I mean, like, when you look here, there's a huge and wide disconnect between what movements are doing um, and then what the electoral vehicle of the left kind of says and, and wants to even do. It almost seems like the NDP just doesn't want to take power, doesn't want to have power in its hands. But we understand <laughs> that this is this is fundamentally important and they, we could actually bring about like positive social change and make this this country, um, you know, govern for working people instead of on their backs, right? Um, but I think just to, to touch upon what, what you were talking about in, in Colombia, we can't look at, at Petro's election uh, and this kind of, this, this sweep of left in Latin America without the movements. Um, mm-hmm. A year prior to the election, there was the this national strike that really energized a lot of uh, poor working class and young Colombians and got them involved in real social struggle. Like people were, were fighting police officers, riot police in the streets, and uh, it, was, it was quite widespread in multiple cities. People were actually fighting back against uh, COVID lockdowns, against uh, wage suppression, things like this. And so we need to be able to actually tap into these movements to, to be able to elect um, le- uh, people like Petro 
um, at least here in Canada, if you know, we can draw some sort of parallel to that. But contextually, I, I really want to say Venezuela is very different from Colombia and from Chile and even from Mexico. Um, since 2014, with I guess with, with the death of Chavez and the drastic decline in, in the price of oil, um, and you know a very coordinated campaign uh, of sanctions from the U.S., the EU, and Canada, uh, the country is, is very much suffering. Some of the stories that people were telling me were like we you know for for several for several months we could only buy like things that were produced here, so like coffee, mangoes, and and maybe rubber. Um, they couldn't import commodities, basic things to, to kind of get by. Uh, some refugee agencies estimate the number of Venezuelans who have left to be somewhere between five to seven million. And that's a, that's a lot of people. This isn't like just the rich and, and you know, white collar professionals fleeing the country. This is people from very poor neighborhoods saying, I can't make a living here and I have to leave uh, to be able to find a job and support my family. And it's, to, to some degree, it's, it's kind of ironic. Like the Maduro government has kind of really lasted all these sanctions. Like the Lima Group, uh, which is an organization that, that Canada heads, an informal organization of states in the Western Hemisphere, um, was formed right before this Pink Tide Part Two, with all the, when all these right-wing governments were were running countries from you know Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, and they sought to to bring together uh, condemnation, so um, forwarding cases to the International Criminal Court, uh, so a case against Venezuela. Canada is a signatory to this. Um, they tried to uh, adopt diplomatic pressure and and economic pressure, of course, with sanctions. Today, the Lima Group really doesn't function anymore. All the Latin American countries that signed on now have leftist presidents that really have no concern for putting sanctions on on Maduro. Um, so you know, while the while the government has has very much kind of survived in in a very you know dire economic state, um, it, it has this kind of wherewithal and tenacity. Um, but it's also turned to some degree very very repressive against working people, like when. During the, the national strike, uh, people were comparing like the, the repression the military in Colombia was using to the, um, like in Venezuela, it's called the Operation, uh, Operation Liberate the People, OLPs. And these are, these are massive human rights infringements where uh, militarized riot police would enter poor neighborhoods and just kind of spray bullets everywhere. Um, they, would, they would kill youth, plant guns on their bodies, uh, very dirty stuff. And you know the government came out. I think in, in 2019, saying the, the policies were a mistake, um, mm -hmm. that we've killed up to, and they estimate 7,000 people. So the situation I saw in Venezuela was, um, it, it's hard to compare to, to another country in Latin America. Even it's hard to compare to a country that's not in a state of war, and to be honest, just the level of, of depravity. Um, but you know, fixing that context, I visited in, in, in spring 2022, and it, this was the first year of like positive growth that, that Venezuelans have seen since 2014. So I guess the, sh the short lesson here, the, the quick lesson I want to get out is when you elect a leftist government, you have to be willing to fight because uh, there will be pressure on, on the government, on the social movements, on the people that actually benefit from government policies. Um, and that's really Venezuela has been punished for, for daring to stand up. So how are social movements responding to these conditions? Because when I think of South American social movements, I think of them, I guess, with any um, country being either on the offense or on the defense. And typically when you're successful in electing a progressive government, you can start to refocus your energies rather than constantly fighting back. But this seems to be a very unique situation in Venezuela where, yeah, how are they responding so, no, that's a great question. Um, I think the the one of the, like one of the organizations that I spoke to um, that actually has a, a lot of relevance for 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 what we see here in Canada, especially with like deindustrialization. Um, you know, you see it in Hamilton, you see it in, in small towns all around Ontario. Just the town factory leaves, um, and then you know it gets converted into a bunch of call centers, and people have to kind of grapple with this, this change into the service sector. Um, I visited a city called Puerto Ordaz, and it's in Bolivar State, so very, very much in the interior of the country, in the Amazon. And the city was designed in the 50s to export raw materials with light processing and, and send it out to the world market. Um, so it, it's one of the most factory-dense parts of the country. It's, it's country. But during the crisis, uh, 
a series of factory uh, factory owners would would just abandon their plants. Um, would seek to kind of strip the plants of their like machines and, and sell it for parts, whatever they had. And this is in, in part due to, to government policy, like the government was trying to institute wage reforms, like increase the minimum wage, uh, have longer times for, for parental leaves, basic things like this. Um, the government attempted to pass some of these wage reforms during like in the middle of this crisis. Um, and at that point, a few of the bosses tried to leave. Now, workers themselves actually ended up blockading their factories. So there's this this one great piece on, on Venezuela analysis. I met some of these workers, but Sierra Pascual Marquina and, and Chris Gilbert, um, two contributors to Venezuela analysis, professors um, at the Bolivarian Universities in Caracas, inter- sat down and interviewed these workers and, and talked to them about their first experiences um, kind of with these like uh, rapid changes to their standard of living and, and the prospect of the boss leaving the plant. And these workers said, you know, at first we tried to form a union. We tried to unionize um, and actually kind of just institute wage demands. But then when we saw the boss was actually trying to, to sell the, pack, the factory for scraps, the factory we've worked at for 40, 50 years, some of us, we blockaded the factory in. We stopped the, the, the movement out of, of goods. And they did this uh, in Endorca, um, like a, a steel production plant that services um, like the oil industry, they they held the the perimeter for two years in in having twenty four hour watches. They slept in the bushes. They ate iguanas. Some of their uh, their members went out and got jobs in other plants so they could still fund the blockade of this plant. Now after about two years, uh, they applied to have it expropriated. This didn't work. The the government was really not willing to expropriate the plant. So they, they have a very different set of property laws than, than we have in Canada, but they ended up uh, applying for a specific title for the factory to be a social property enterprise. And it allowed the workers to uh, form a mixed commission with the boss. So there would be two representatives from the workers and one from the boss, and they would run the plant. Uh, now, in the case of Indorca, the bosses didn't want to participate. Uh, so the government, uh, according to the law, gave the third position to the workers. So the workers elected their own managers and restarted production themselves. And they're actually still operating today. So I think they, they seized the plant finally in 2019. Uh, and they're fulfilling service contracts and they're going forward. Um, now workers from, like, and this is like, I've been to picket lines in Canada where this has happened, where the bosses removed um, like the, the machinery. This happened at GM in Oshawa. There's U.S. steel plants in Hamilton that have been on strike like this for almost a decade, really. Um, so I think that's a core lesson here. Like we, we actually like if we're taking industrial action, we have to get to the point of okay, we can't let the boss take away the means of production from the factories themselves, or else we're going to be guaranteed out of jobs. They're not going to bring this stuff back. That's just the obvious truth. And in, in, in this case of Indorca. They were, they were very aware of this. But these workers went on uh, to join up with two other um, occupied factories. One is Calderis, so it's a factory seized from a French um, conglomerate. And um, they, they've, with these factories, they formed a, an organization called the Productive Workers' Army. Um, and it's, it's a very new organization, and they go around to different social movements and, and what we call communes in Venezuela, um, other kind of collective organizations that kind of have their own democratic structures, have assemblies, um, and they actually control production. Uh, a lot of communes are based in, in like the countryside, uh, so I'm based in, in small towns and in, in more or less village communities. So they, they go to these communes and they actually build infrastructure for them um, to, to be able to like produce goods. So like um, coffee grounding machines for, for communeros working with um, in the coffee sector, for instance. But so I, I, I tend to rant as, as my academic way. I'm sitting here wondering what the response would be should that have been tried at the GM plant. And I know you talked about like property laws being different, but I can only imagine that would not last two years. Like we would see police intervention. And I'm just so used to blockades and movements being thwarted by injunctions, simple injunctions. So how do we get from that where we are now to that far more militant approach to individual workplaces? And and to be clear, they were non-unionized. 
they it was a, it was an interesting situation. They had a union, but it was more of a yellow union. So it, it was really in the pocket of management, and they they really felt that you know the state and the bosses were kind of working against them in in that respect. Like uh, their union officials would would really kind of have these backdoor meetings with with the employer. So they were trying to actually escape the one union they had in Endorka and move uh, into a more autonomous union where they had more control of the situation. Um, but I think oh, that, uh, that's a whole other conversation as well, right? Because I know, a lot I, of I'm trying to simplify it a little because uh, the the politics gets a little thick or can get a little thick, and yeah. Because yeah, it just opens up all these other questions that I'll, I have to our labor movement and alternatives. Because quite often, folks here use the traditional avenues, right? Um, get elected a delegate run for office, take over the union, you know, or uh, mobilize the rank and file to do something similar, like put pressure through those same sim- si- systems. But what you're describing is, again, just so unique to what I thought was possible, I guess. I'm so stuck in in this kind of Canadian perspective, I think. Santiago, like, what are you feeling? Yeah, just thinking, like, I'm also contrasting with how militant unions across Latin America have played such an influential role. Like, the natural thing I started thinking about was, you know, in in Bolivia, after um, the coup against Evo Morales, it was the unions that led to the rebuilding of the movement that then got the Movimiento del Socialismo Party elected... um, again afterwards and and how involved uh the unions were in resisting against the authoritarian regime that had been created right and this seems to be something that's quite common across latin america which is that organized militant labor is at the center of so many struggles no certainly i mean like there's cases in argentina with where people were doing the exact same thing that i saw in venezuela just seizing their factories this was like, you know, in the early 2000s with the, the really like um, frontal attacks of neoliberalism against, you know, what was barely a welfare state in Argentina. Um, but I, I think like one of the some of the deficiencies we have, I mean, like, I guess to contextualize their experience just even a little more. Um, there's a very healthy skepticism amongst working class people of, of trade union leadership and political leadership. Um, and I think that's. When we buy into like, oh, yeah, let's do the delegate thing. And then we, we actually see from being a delegate the limits of what you can do. Um, I think the next step in what I saw with, the, with what they were doing was screw, screw this apparatus that you have that I can't actually do anything positive for people in. I'm going to try to do my own thing. Um, and in their case, they... Our own thing. Our own thing. Exactly. Um, they were trying to do, uh, you know, our own thing. But, you know, there, there are difficulties, and I guess to contextualize this a bit more, like in uh, Puerto Ordaz, in, in 2000, or since the beginning of the Bolivarian movement, has elected Chavista representatives to the National Assembly and also to their state gover- uh, government. Now, in, in 2008, there was a, a huge kind of eruption of, of open labor struggle, um, and the governor of Bolivar State had actually called in the, the, the military, so the, the National Guard, to contain the protests of, of steel workers. Now, at the at the helm of this demonstration were, were all the union leaders. Like, you know, same thing in Canada when you go to like a Labor Day parade, the union leadership's at the front. The National Guard opened fire with live ammunition against like these union leaders. And this is like the Bolivarian government doing it against, you know, their their own kind of people, or at least the Bolivarian governor. After this, immediately after, Chavez expropriated the steel sector and brought it under state control. He realized, he said, like, look, the governor clearly screwed up in, 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 in pushing forward um, with repression. Chavez, in response to, to kind of this violence against working class people, caved, in, caved into their demands immediately, expropriated the sector um, and kind of really a, a allowed a more kind of state centric planning um, of production to kind of occur in the steel sector at that point. But the government has not always been on the, the, the working class's side, and the union bureaucrats as well. So there's a, an, an, an incredible amount of understanding that like our organizations that we see right now are not going to be there without us, um, and we could easily brush them to the side if, if need be. 
now this is a, a little harder said than done, um, kind of given the context. But overall, there was the you know despite the the amount of kind of like poverty, the odds against them, like uh, the workers in these occupied factories are blacklisted. Like they they have trouble finding supplies, they have trouble finding contracts, because what kind of capitalist wants to actually deal with these kinds of plants? Right? Who who would really want to encourage this? This is a, a very dangerous example to other people. And it's it's it becomes embarrassing actually to to the government um, in, in in some instances. Uh, to be to be uh, precise, the productive workers army was asked to repair kind of um, a gas like a gas tank, and this was one of the biggest um, gas tanks I guess in the world, and one of the biggest refineries in Venezuela. Um, and the manager of the specific plant said it would it would cost about you know two point five million American to import kind of a new tank. They went in and fixed it for free. They patched it up <laughs> and, and it completely worked. So this is the example of like working class dynamism and, and the ability of like working people to actually fix these problems. Um, management on one hand was, was willing to write off a, a $2 million check despite the extremely hard circumstances the country's facing. And through solidarity and collective action, these workers managed to, to come together and, and just fix the, the key industry in the country. Um, and I've actually seen pictures of this battle, and it's the most Latin American thing ever. There's these engineers working on on stuff, and there's a guy with a quattro just playing guitar to like amp up the mood of of the people there to you know while they're working just to get them energized. See, I don't know if I've worked in really bad places, but this is a unique camaraderie that seems to exist naturally. Just the way folks unite beside one another in the workplace, like whereas that doesn't always happen here you know even in a unionized workplace but also that sense of ownership over the means of production like almost like they know they really own it or should own it and are incensed at the idea that it would go to waste that it would be sold off and i think that's where we really lack in it that's unfathomable to us most workers here you know that's the bosses he they pay, that's company property. I mean, even even the stuff we take home is like that's theirs, <laughs> even though we're the only ones that work on it. And it's it's how we do. But that seems very unique. And even as you describe the, the music that goes alongside of it, um, not to say we don't sing on our picket lines, but it just seems much more familial than the workplaces that that I've been. I don't know. You guys worked anywhere like that where you're just like, that's it. We're not going to take this anymore. And I mean, I can tell you, like, as a musician, that people look at me like I'm crazy if I start playing music in the workplace. Maybe that's what's missing, Santiago. During during election night, I brought my flute to the newsroom because I'm a, I'm a journalism student, and and this was like the most normal thing in my head, and everybody looked at me like I was insane. For, but the, honestly, like, we need to bring back working music you know that 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 the, it's the cultural stuff and i talk about that a lot too that like and, and that's what i don't mean to get on a bit of a tangent here but that is a big part of like building movements it's also building like community and to build community culture is an element of that and art and music and dancing and like these things go as a part of that and i feel like sometimes we forget about that. And you just reminded me about that because, you know, like that is that is a very Latino thing, right? Like, yeah, I, I can picture that in my head already. And, and, and yeah, no, that's amazing. Oh, but like you said, <laughs> like culture is like the soul of the commons. You know what I mean? It's this thing that could just very easily unite us all. Um, and I mean, like I've worked in restaurants for much of my life. And when like a catchy song kind of starts playing and like we're all in the back, the coworkers, the chefs will start singing along. Um and, you know, I've, I've seen that kind of smile, that warm feeling you get. But still, like, you know, it's it's not the same kind of um, militancy. It's not the same willingness to sacrifice. Um, like when, when QP had this, you know, almost strike, um, you know, I was I was thinking, you know, is Fred Hahn going to get put in cuffs? Like, what's what's going to happen next? Right. Or I wanted to see this. I'm like, yeah, man, like I've been paying my dues <laughs> as a QP member for years. You're standing up for us. And like. Man, Fred Hahn, like I was on strike with QP3903 at, at work. We're the, the at, at York, sorry. We're the first union um, that uh, Doug Ford legislated back to work. 
and I think we were the first law he passed to legislate us back to work. And Fred Hahn, man, he gave a speech when we were at Queens Park, and I'm like, yes, let's storm this place and throw this guy out. It's like he just gets you going. Um, but yeah, I, I really want to see that from our union leaders in, in this country, like go to jail, really like fight for us, um, f- fight, fight for our rightful wage increases, fight for us to, to be able to, to live with dignity. There's not enough of these people in the movement or the people who have been there are extremely comfortable. No, yeah, I agree so strongly with that. And I know that's a lot to ask, but at the same time, there's people who are willing to make that sacrifice who are willing to put their life on the line in that kind of way and i feel like yeah like if we're gonna get anywhere we're gonna have to be a little uncomfortable sometimes and i feel like the second things get uncomfortable in canada is when things fall apart and no i mean jess says what do you think about this it just makes me think of how canadian politics and politicians have been this sounds awful, watered down and where you need that fiery, vibrant militancy, like we're in a class war and we really do lack somebody standing up there telling us to take up proverbial arms. Aside from the music, like I think we joked around about that, but the more that we talk about that, it's, it is part of that culture and that, that color that needs to be part of any movement that also makes it fun and emotional. And it just seems to stand in such contrast to what we want or what the political class here in Canada seem to want, right? We've done a lot of discussions about the NDP and their desire to have candidates who don't stir the pot, who don't use inflammatory language. And this seems to be quite the opposite. And I just, I love how we're hitting on all of these key things that are missing, but aren't things that aren't out of our reach. You know what this just reminded me of too was, I just remembered a speech that Lula gave and I I cannot remember exactly what he said, but before he went to jail, um, I remember he gave this, this very iconic speech and he was inspiring people, you know, that, they may be locking him up, but that the movement like has to continue that he was, he turned himself in, right? Like he was willing to go to jail to keep everything alive, you know? And that's, I I feel like that's exactly kind of like what we're talking about. And I just remember that because that was such a powerful moment and we don't see that here, you know? No, definitely. My main concern when we talk about, you know, how we can make our labor movement a lot more militant or mimic what we see in South America. And I'd like to ask Alex if you think that, and I know not all the countries in South America are the same and the labor movements within them are definitely not the same, but typically social movements are non-hierarchical or the good ones are, right? And what we're aiming for is a post-neoliberal world, Um, But if we are using institutions that are in itself colonial and defer still to neoliberalism, are they actually transforming? Are we end up are is South America actually ending up with the kind of progressive governments that they need versus ones that are still somewhat tolerant to resource extraction from uh, external forces so that's i guess why i'm looking to the social movement specifically on how they can maybe transform something different or demand something different too in in the people they put in power they're responsible for putting in power i i think the the question that, that you bring up has has definitely been thought about in scholarly discussion with no like clear-cut answer um what <laughs> yeah, there's like, there's Jeffrey Weber, a, a, a prof up at York, wrote a book called, I think the day after the revolution uh, is, is more of the same or something to this effect, uh, about the original Pink Tide saying like, you know, we elected all these governments, but, uh, you know, inequality is still very much entrenched. Um, we still have the bending to resource extraction. And there's, there's still a lot of this in, in Pink Tide V2, right? 
uh, like Gabriel Boric, uh, the the guy in in Chile, the the president of Chile, is like a modest social democrat. Like this is like what you would see in in Chile is the the best you could hope for from Jagmeet Singh's like NDP, uh, and it's it's still a high degree of tolerance for for the multinational mining companies. Um, in 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 Peru, it's it's the same story, uh, and. You know, we, we shouldn't sanitize the, the legacy of, of the first pink tide, but that's that's exactly where the social movements come in. It's to hold the feet to the fire. It's to make sure that the, the, the promises of these governments um, actually gets kind of taken up. Where I, where I kind of saw, um, like in, in Venezuela, we don't have the exact same parallel with state repression of the left uh, as, as they do there, uh, or just, I guess, about anybody, uh, really, just because the situation's been so dire. Like, we're talking about coup attempts, mercenary incursions to overthrow the government, drone attacks on the president. Like, um, it's it's really bred a, a high um, a high degree of paranoia, to be honest, from state leadership. But you know, even in the cracks, uh, social movements that have supported the government um, and and social movements that have just really come come from the base uh, of of just regular uh, rank and file chavistas have been able to kind of emerge. So another group that I I spoke to is called Pueblo a Pueblo, and there's the English translation is a bit tricky. It could either mean like people to people or town town to town. They the, uh, so a bunch of their I guess organizers again from Chavistas realized like there was a serious concern with getting food into cities that people were facing from uh, acute hunger. Um, so they they went into small communities and, and communes in, in in the countryside um, and began organizing kind of network distribution of of food produced on these kind of small I guess more or less peasant or mom and pop farm, uh, you know, uh, sites of production and getting their food out into the cities. And I'd like when walking around Caracas, you, you see these markets of these, these peasants coming in and, and kind of selling their goods at what they call solidarity prices, uh, not government subsidized, just really what the farmers could, could bare bones afford to make end meat, selling it to, to really poor barrio dwellers and or urban slum dwellers rather. Um, but it, it, it's interesting, like when, when I met some of these, these folks, I went to a, a, a place that Chavez built called um, Ciudad Caribia. So not to, to go on a, a really long tangent, but um, a lot of poor in Latin America, a lot of poor communities are built up on hills into mountains. And this because of, you know, ecological change and, and even like regular seasonal like rainstorms, uh, it makes them really susceptible to mudslides and, and destruction. So from like one day to the next, like your house is gone, you don't have insurance. It's not the same kind of situation that we would expect like here with people facing disaster. Um, so essentially Chavez built victims of the, these mudslides, uh, their own like little kind of town at the top of, of this mountain. Uh, and going there was some of the most breathtaking like views I've ever seen in my life. Just an, um, amazingly beautiful. Um, but they were actually supplying um, food to, to schools like directly giving it to like principals. Um, so it was a little weird because like I was there kind of like as this researcher and like I was with some of like the more like administrative staff of Pueblo a Pueblo and there was like one guy hauling all this food and I'm like, guys, come on. <laughs> like I can't, I can't in good conscience watch this one guy lug around like a 60 pound bag of like corn. So, you know, we all got our hands dirty and, and kind of lifted food into the school and it was... Uh, it was it, it was wild to to see because like in in their constitution, children have to be given food twice a day in schools. And the government, what they were what they were doing, were importing food, processed food, food that wasn't actually like of nutritional value. And I mean, like I'm talking about food in schools, and like in the United States, you know, they have like lunch debt. You know what I mean? Like this ridiculous concept that is just it's terrible, it's capitalistic, and it's parasitic. When it comes to talking about food in schools, we don't even have to look anywhere. We can look at Canada because this is something uh, I'm actually just currently writing articles about, um, which is the fact that Canada is ranked 37th out of uh, 40 something wealthy nations in the world for childhood food insecurity, where one third of kids in Canada don't have access to breakfast um, due to food insecurity, where um, something like it's over a quarter, something like, yeah, something like a quarter of BIPOC households are struggling with food insecurity. Something like, uh, I think it's around a sixth of infants struggle with food insecurity, which is like... It's a ridiculous number, a sixth rid of infants. Yeah, it's, 
yeah, households with children are twice as likely to struggle with food insecurity in Canada. We're the only G7 nation without a school uh, breakfast program, which uh, inspired, of course, by the Black Panthers. Shout out to the Black Panthers. Uh, yeah, we're the only one who doesn't have that. So Canada is so woefully behind in that. And I, I just want to mention because there's that should be incredibly radicalizing for everybody because there's absolutely nothing you can do to blame a child for not being able to have food. And the impact that that has on increasing uh, the cycle of poverty because, you know, how does that affect their education? How does that affect their ability to learn, to be successful in school, to be able to... Le- what what comes after school, right? And so, yeah, just I wanted to throw that out there because it's a huge issue in Canada. And it's good to see that there's, you know, something being done about that in, in Latin America, at least. And, and, and frankly, that is, I have no idea how we don't have a massive movement, movement around that here because it's, we're at the bottom of the, uh, of the list, essentially, in terms of dealing with that. We have like a weird, like second bestism, like, you know, whatever happens, we point to the States and it's a weird political cultural <laughs> thing. Yeah. And I just, I don't get it. It's like, they're dead last. And well, I think that leads me to my question because the Americans, like their constitution is so rife with issues and our charter itself, you know, doesn't secure economic rights. So when you mention something like lunch twice a day, like something so very specific, a collective responsibility, one that makes sure people are fed. I mean, that's completely lacking from our idea of what governance is for at the moment. We talk about mutual aid a lot, but and it's necessary, people are hungry, but that is a shift in ideology, right? That's normalizing the idea that we have to scrape what we can and rather than doing it on the larger scale that government facilitates. So I wonder if you think it's like the chicken or the egg, right? Is it in the constitution because it was an understood ideal, a cultural understanding, or, you know, did they, were successful Chavez, you know, put it in the constitution, I assume, um, you know, get a progressive government, instill things in the constitution that start to ingrain it from there. I ask because, you know, is our energy, should our energy be spent at any some level petitioning, God petitions, petitioning the government to rewrite our charter. I, and I, without opening that whole debate on, is it possible? I just, is, is, is there value in shifting the constitution or does it ha- that have to happen at a different level? The contrast between how the Canadian constitution was adopted and how like the more recent Latin American constitutions were adopted is very stark. Like we had just a bunch of elites write our constitution and like submit it through like an amendment formula. Um, like in, in Chile, most recently, I think they, they had like an actual like, you know, you vote for a, con- uh, con- uh, a person to go to a constitutional convention. So we had like a democratic process to, to bring community concerns. And then, you know, unfortunately in Chile, they, you know, they drafted this constitution, they put it up for referendum and it got defeated. Um, but, you know, I think the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is we have to work with what we have. Um, and it's, you know, I heard a lot of like, you know, our glorious constitution, our great constitutional rights when, when I was in Venezuela from like militant socialists, right? But then when I told them like, oh, you know, your constitution still has private property rights. Ours in Canada doesn't. People would look at me gobsmacked. They're like, what do you mean? Like, you don't have guaranteed constitutional private property rights. And I'd say, yeah, it's a paradox. We have uh, all these mining companies that set up shop here and, and commit, you know, atrocities in, in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Um, but yet their, their assets aren't constitutionally protected. Given this, you know, actually legislating your way to like a more socialist society is quite easy in this country. They're not, it's not a constitutional, you know, amendments to, to actually take like Bell and Rogers and nationalize them, for instance, right? It's a small change to the Property Act. It's a legislative change that could be passed quite easily. Um, that's again, what, when With I, when the I started right people it. in power. Yeah. You have to want power. We need leftists who want to actually do good things with power. And that's, that's what we don't have. Well, that's a whole other discussion. I suppose we don't have leftists running any parties at the moment. So <laughs> we are such a far step from that because one just needs to, you know, point to BC where social movements did play a part in getting the NDP elected with hopes that the, they would be allies to the environmentalist movement and, 
could enact some reforms that would be lasting, you know, especially when you get a majority government. So that's, you know, that's clearly not our way just yet. I also think it's worth mentioning that in the vast majority of electoral victories in Latin America, these were new parties that were created in recent history, right? And I don't fully know what the end. I don't, and not fully, I don't know what the answer is in Canada. But I, I just want to throw that out there because, you know, the idea of working outside of the NDP is met with a lot of hesitancy and and i understand where people are coming from when it comes to that hesitancy but it is worth noting that in latin america that's exactly what people did they worked outside of the traditional parties and they won in that way and that's worth something no it's certainly um it's there are limits to our kind of parliamentary system in terms of new parties coming in um like pacto historico in colombia you know Petro's party is, is very new. Um, and it's ex- exactly what, you know, kind of, I think what you're referring to. Um, but it's, it's a lot difficult to navigate when you have a uh, social democracy that is just, you know, doesn't mobilize purposefully. Um, and then tries to talk about, you know, weird terms like greedflation and like home heating bills for, you know, subsidies for your landlord to kind of take the sweat off your back. In, in Latin America, there's there's a very much um, among social movements. Um, I, I, I don't want to be so broad as to say all of Latin America, but uh, at least kind of what I saw in, in certain parts of Venezuela, a real kind of embracing of we're going to come together and converge to, to kind of do these specific things. And if, you know, our time is done, our time is done, I'll move on to the next kind of task to organize. There's always something pressing. Um, I had the fortune of being in uh, a... a parish of Caracas called the 23rd of January and the social movements there are so strong that they actually have an oral pact with the police not to enter the community. I saw one cop in this neighborhood and this guy was in the subway station and he was running to get off the train to get into like a a staff entrance and he didn't want anybody to see him. Like you'd walk you'd walk around and you'd see like National Guardsmen who are not police they're army but they'd be around without without their weapons. Um, Now there's two, there's a lot of, I guess the term is uh, that we see a lot in North American news about Venezuela is colectivo. And this is a very kind of fuzzy term. Some colectivos act like, you know, pro government thugs um, and not just against like, you know, right wing insurrectionists, against like, you know, garbage workers protesting their rights. Uh, some of these collectivos will go in and act as, you know, thugs or, or security. But other ones um, actually form form communes and try to actually give back to their community. Um, so this one that I saw, Alexis Vive, they kind of run security for like, or organize around 22 blocks in the 23rd of January. Um, they know who gets in the neighborhood. They have a CCTV camera set up. So it's kind of weird. It's like an abolitionist politics, but still like we're using the tools of the uh, oppressor to make sure that people aren't dealing drugs in our neighborhood. Like we could actually like look around and, and see strangers coming in. Uh, they have a hotline, like a tip line. So it very much works like a 911 call center, except without the police. And they defuse the situation. If there's like a drug deal going down, they kick the drug dealer out of the area. They've also done things like, um, like they run like a, their own kind of garbage collection that they organically use with like pigs. So they get these like urban pigs in this like area to eat like garbage that the city won't take. Um, they have like a, a swimming pool that they filled up with fish and they turned it into like a fish, like an Olympic sized swimming pool. And they turned it into like a fish farm uh, so that the community could have access to, to fish whenever they wanted to. Um, this like sound like Santiago, I see you're smiling. Like this sounds crazy. Like thinking about this in Canada, like, you know, and like just turning a swimming pool into this is just absurd. But it's it's the reality. Like if you don't have access to garbage or if you don't have access to like to to this, these kinds of food, like people appreciate this, right? It's that kind of basic level of mutual aid that that people are firmly kind of uh, aware of and behind. I, I'm telling uh, Santiago smiling because he envisions the same here. You know, I think you're you're reminding him too of what he'd like to see. You know, he gave a shout out to the Black Panthers earlier. That's for you know a, a reason, right, Santiago? You know, like you're. These I these yeah. seem to be like your I see your brain just filling with ideas and 
in terms of mutual aid and community building. Yeah, like if we wait for a government to come in and help people, we're going to be waiting entirely too long and people are going to continue suffering. You know, it's this kind of like innovative community driven work that that we we need to start seeing more because like I said, like th- I think there's a, a misconception as to how well off people are doing in Canada. There's a lot of people who are living in, in a real deep poverty, a poverty that is much more invisible than even like, you know, like in the United States, there's a lot of poverty. That poverty is a lot more visible. You know, you go to a lot of places in the United States, you can see the poverty, you can feel the suffering. I feel like people in Canada don't realize that, a very similar situation is happening here, but it's much more hidden. And and what do we, do we just accept that that's the reality until we can completely change everything? No, like that's we're not going to completely change everything tomorrow and people tomorrow are going to be hungry, you know, and I want to see, you know, out of building that kind of community driven solidarity, that's where it starts. You know, that's where the movements should begin and no, that that's that's very much my praxis. I feel like all these stories that Alex has are part of the solution, which is glad I'm I'm glad we're recording them and, and amplifying them because yeah, like we, we can't just wait until it gets so bad that we can't envision anything else. Like we can draw from these and we don't often get to hear stories of success from South America. Obviously, our our news is completely Eurocentric and any examples of real people power does not make our airwaves, especially these really specific examples of workplaces or communities that you've been able to provide. Um, I think I think it would be great if people could just hear more of these and and envision what's possible. I, I, and I keep saying like, oh, is it a cultural thing? And and I think that's just an easy out, you know, but there is a lot of work to do like, in terms of what people envision, how they see themselves in terms of power structures and abilities. Um, I wanted to pivot just before we run out of time, because I think we spent a lot of time talking about social movements in South American countries where they have friendly governments. But before we started recording, well, friendlier governments, because you've given us some examples to, you know, food for thought there, definitely. But before we started recording, Santiago was talking about you know, how difficult and dangerous it is to be a proponent of the left in South America. And although Colombia was successful, there's still resistance in South America, surely social movements that are in the defensive position I described earlier, you know? And just also building on that, one thing that's important to mention whenever you're talking about Latin America is U.S. imperialism and not just U.S. imperialism, Canadian imperialism too, right? And the violence and the danger that comes from that. And that's a conversation we hate, like... I just wanted to bring that up, the tie on top of that. Because, um, yeah, like Alec talks about the role of social movements in other governments. It's like hold the feet to the fire. But how do they, I'm, and, and where I believe we don't have the level of state oppre- oppression that's comparable, it still would be hostile to a lot of these endeavors, right? You would face maybe violent resistance even to try to attempt some of the things that Alex is talking about. So, and it kind of brings back to the land back discussion where there's this immense sense of courage, despite the paranoia that might exist, rightfully so, the knowledge that in U.S. imperialism is always looming and and other repercussions of not towing the line of neoliberalism, embargoes, but still that that courage that exists and that determination that these movements are responsible for these t- turns in history, right? Where it wasn't always just appealing to the government or the constitution, but actual fights on their hand. Can anybody lend some insight as to 
So in like being a, a like a left winger in, in Venezuela is, is very different than than in Colombia. Um, like, you know, just f- just from my reading, not my my lived experiences, people going through like checkpoints of like AUC, I think they're called like self-defense units, um, which are like landlord back m- militias. If they know you're a leftist, like they'll execute you right right there. Like it's it's dangerous. And these organizations were, were backed by the presidency for the past three, three or four presidents, at least. Um, so it's it's quite quite hard in in that context. But sorry, go ahead. No, even lo- I was just thinking even longer. Like that's been a hundred years plus of that kind of resistance. Certainly, in in Venezuela, given like the the Bolivarian Re- Revolution, a lot of the like older people I would I would talk to who had like a you know firm memories of what it was like living in the '60s, the '70s, and the '80s. Remember the state repression. They remember like you know their neighbors disappearing after you know you know scatter bombing like leftist propaganda on campus um or like hiding a gun in their like house for like a friend who was involved in the insurgency uh things like this but again like not the same kind of politics in in, in the same exact way but on the on the role of of u.s u.s imperialism and canadian imperialism it's i don't understand the canadian foreign policy anymore like it literally doesn't make sense it's nobody else is is hostile to this government or these people anymore we're really tail ending the US and we're even we're tail ending an opposition. Like we're so involved in this other nation's democracy that we're recognizing another government that doesn't exist, the government of Juan Guaido, um, which officially in in kind of the Canadian like diplomatic channels, they don't talk to Maduro. There's no like embassy in Venezuela anymore. There's no communication. Like to get my visa to go into Venezuela, I had to go to Mexico City. Right? Like it's there's you know the government here needs to really like end the hostility uh, against the Venezuelan government because it only hurts the people. Um, and it actually makes the society more corrupt. To get around the blockade, the government passed something called the anti-blockade law. Um, and in this, they said all private, all procurement uh, of government contracts are, is to be conducted secretly. This is not transparent, but this is because of the blockade. This is literally because of one incident, uh, incident where they were trying to sell oil to a refinery in, in India. The United States got wind of this and then sent a message to you know, the owners of this refinery saying, if you accept the shipment of Venezuelan oil, we will blacklist you from the American market. We will no longer accept anything that you produce in the United States. That for any company is, is suicide, right? So immediately they, they, you know, they backed off and they, they, the, the refinery refused to, to process the Venezuelan oil. So they, they passed this anti-blockade law, and now like nobody nobody knows. Like even like government supporters are like, we, we have no idea what the government's doing with the budget. We have no idea who the government's paying for what and how much. And in this, if if you think about it, there's huge opportunities for graft and corruption. But and these are like the direct effects of, of the sanctions to to make a democratic regime, right? To actually make the it actually makes the situation worse and unlivable, not just on the population, but at the level of government procurement and, and finances. And one can only imagine these acts and lack of transparency would, are just going to be used to demonize that government who are simply acting in response. But I guess we, we know that game over and over. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, it's, it's like you, you create a situation in which the government has to be secret and then you call them corrupt. Like from our perspective, a hundred percent but from the, the perspective of social movement activists it's a bind that it's hard to get around right it's like you want to keep these people honest but you don't have the means to right so it's there's an element of despair i don't want to throw just straight up hope um but you know their situation does come with these these nuances that are that are still difficult it does make me think and i've been thinking about this a lot lately which is now that there there is a such a widespread movement around Latin America, you know, historically there has been such a dependence economically on the United States, you know, on the West in general. But Latin America is a very, it is a very rich region in terms of rich in resources, rich in the, the land is very fertile, you know. For me, I would like to see going forward is more unity within Latin America and working together, these governments working together so that they don't have to rely as much on the West, on the United States. And I have heard, you know, 
Lula was starting to say something about maybe a common currency. I know that's been tried something like that in the past. It hasn't necessarily taken off yet, but for all of I South think, America. Yeah. Yeah. Something. I, I think what they're looking at is they look at the European union and they say, you know, something similar to that. And I don't know, but I do think that like there needs to be something so that when when it comes to like these blockades, you know, something that Venezuela, but also Cuba has uh, endured for such a long time that those would lose the power that they have if the region learned to work together. I don't know, um, Alex, what? No, oh, there's so much more strength. Um you know, if we if we put like petty provincialism aside, right, and actually see like a continental unity, Lula's proposal, um, I think it was in the run up to the elections. It was one of these very like hopeful, kind of energetic, bringing us together, not hostile, um, which was a, a very stark counterpoint to Bolsonaro's politics in Latin America. It was just extremely divisive, talking down to other leaders, that kind of stuff. But I mean. Hugo Chavez talked about this in the early 2000s, talked about having a, a one, you know, solid currency. Um, it's, it's, you know, just the way kind of elections play out across the region that, like, we didn't have Petro elected 10, 10, 15 years ago, right? Things would have been very different. And I mean, on that note, having leftist leaders in power in these different countries uh, actually helps people a lot. Like, one of the first things Petro did was open up the Venezuela-Colombia border. Uh, to, to free trade, he really took the power, by doing this, he took the power away from, you know, cartels and, and gangs, more or less, and, and allowed people to just, you know, freely enter and exit uh, neighboring countries. And people on the border, it's, it's an interesting region because it, the border doesn't exist, right? Like, think about, like, the Alberta, the border between, like, Alberta and, like, the United States. Like, you could walk around the border and across the border, you wouldn't even know. I wonder, in an attempt to combat U.S. imperialism and the forces that we're talking about, do social movements engage in a lot of cross-national work? I, I you, you know, we talked about Lula and Chavez. Uh, that's government level. That's, you know, expected to be working with, with your neighbors. But is there a sense that there is social movements of South America, not of each individual country? Because I think, you know, as a... I, I hate this word as a Westerner. We often envision the continents as holes, right? And the way that South America has been treated by the United States it has been a little bit in the same manner, right? They're dealing with things that we don't have to deal with here. So, yeah, do you find that social movements have engaged in cross-national work to, to build up those movements across borders? Especially the indigenous movements, I would think. No, yeah, definitely. Like a hundred, like some of, like every every case, there was there were people talking about cross national work. Uh, every sorry, every organization that I talked to, in uh, the twenty third of January, when you walk around, you see murals of martyrs. Uh, and I guess one of the the gentlemen I was I was interviewing, Esteban Mihelena, I'd I'd asked him about like you know were there anybody was there anybody who went abroad to like like well I guess we we're talking more about the guerrilla struggles. I asked him, was there anybody who went to, like, um, you know, El Salvador to fight? He's, and he, he said, yeah. And then he starts listing names, like dozens of people. And then he's like, oh, yeah, and in Nicaragua, these were the, the people. And then he's like, oh, yeah, one guy over here in this house as we're walking, like, when we were kids. Like, he, he left when he was 18 uh, to fight for the Sandinistas. Uh, so there's an, there's an incredible amount of cross-pollination. I mean, like, look at the Cuban Revolution, right? Che Guevara was an Argentine. Like, they call him Che because of his, his like, straight-up Argentine accent. Um, so there's, there's an incredible amount of cross-pollination um, from organized workers who are looking to, um, you know, occupied factories in Brazil and in Catalonia, for instance, for, for help and guidance and more or less instruction uh, to, f to farmers who uh, I, I saw were organizing like Zoom seminars with like Mexican farmers as well to talk about how to fight GMOs uh, and, and kind of contamination in their community. Yeah, there's there's a, a, a an, an incredible push by people uh, from the bases of, of of Venezuelan society to connect with other Latin Americans, um, and I mean the fact that everybody speaks the same language is is incredibly helpful. No doubt, um, 
that's something that's clearly lacking. I know a lot of internationalists understand the need for a global structure. St- sorry. A lot of internationalists understand the need for a global struggle, but we don't often engage with it, most of us, in any kind of meaningful way. I feel like there's, I I took crazy notes during this interview. I normally am just writing down what question I can ask next or circle back to something, but I feel like in this one, I was taking genuine notes on where work needs to be done, how you know, any individual one of us can play a role in that. I don't know, but so many lessons, Santiago, you know, do you not feel that? Is that like why you were excited for this particular interview with Alex? Oh, yeah. No, I I feel like, no, yeah, we, we could spend hours and hours and hours and hours and do multiple series of episodes on all of the points that have been raised and all of the points that haven't been raised too, you know. <laughs> yes, my it's, my page is still full of questions that we will never we won't have time for. But. It's vast, and I, and I do think that I think that we have to do that as well. You know, I feel like that's something that's not being talked about enough, and we 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 look at things through such such a narrow field. You know, like especially, I mean, we're all Toronto or Toronto adjacent, right? And even like thinking about stuff outside of Ontario is often not even thought about and I feel like looking at these different issues and how they're playing out across the world I mean one thing you know I I, I wanted to mention this I hadn't mentioned this earlier I, I, I was waiting for like the appropriate time but you know as somebody who is an immigrant from Latin America you know I always kind of grappled with the issue of you know what's going on back at home and should I be there? Should I be here? What am I doing here? You know, why am I fighting here? Why am I not fighting in Colombia? Why am I not doing the work there? And I guess the answer that I always kind of told myself was that Canada, the US, these Western pillars of imperialism, breaking apart and fighting against those structures of imperialism and colonialism within these countries will allow comrades back at home to be more successful in their struggle. And that's a feeling that has been shared by a lot of other Latin immigrants um, in Canada that I've worked with, that I've talked to. That's something that comes up a lot is, you know, we have to do the work here so that they can do the work there. And just the I feel like, you know, we forget how connected everything is, but it it's much more connected than than we discuss. All of these issues play into each other and what's going on there, that will have repercussions here because the wealth, the prosperity of Western societies is built on the blood of Latino America, on the blood of Africa, on the blood of Asia, you know, the exploitation of poorer nations is how we got the wealth. And as these nations begin to be more and more successful in their fight against that, and I mean, as of right now, I have to say, like, U.S. imperialism is not as strong in Latin America as it was. The fact that Petro managed to win, the fact that in Chile, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, you know, there have been so many recent victories. That was not possible before and what and those are going to have consequences here and figuring out what's working there and how it connects to us here that's that's something that you know i want to explore more i i i feel i don't know enough and i want to know so much more you know it, it was like so hard reconciling my place as a researcher from from the global north just being down there and asking these questions um and I, I felt kind of like what you were saying, like, I'm not like Latin American by any means, but it's, it's like, like, what can I do to, to help these struggles advance in this country that, you know, I've studied and then I've met people and then I've, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to kind of break red and make communion with them. Um, and that's, that's a hard thing we have to ask ourselves too. Like, wh- where can we approach um, to, to find resources and, and, and kind of connect, connect the right people in? Um, I've been trying to help the work just on a personal note, 
that the Productive Workers Army is doing because they're they're actually trying to like build stuff for working people to manage on their own. Like they they'll go into workplaces and set up factory councils, letting the workers elect their own managers and, and restarting production. This is like some some stuff that I you know it's hard to for a Canadian brain to just fathom this. Uh, so I've been trying to go to different unions asking for money for for them. You know, it's the the least I can do. Um, at least I can do for their time, their stories, and and just their example that that they they keep on living day in and day out. But on a on a brighter note, like yo, you could always go back, and I'm not saying like don't, right? Uh, I met a, a a guy who works That's for Venezuela. That's the question lately. That that is on my mind. It's it's leave. possible, and I I can't imagine what you must have felt like like watching this, the national strike in Colombia, being like, and I'm here in winter, <laughs> like people are people are fighting the state, and I'm I'm stuck. <laughs> No, you have no idea. And um, one of my one of my closest friends, uh, Sergio, um, he's also from Colombia, and we talk about this a lot. Which is, you know, there is a threshold, there is a line, and we don't know where it is. Where it's like, okay, it does, it just doesn't make any sense anymore for us to be here, and we should go back. And I don't know. No, I just wanted to, to throw out there, uh, there's a writer for Venezuela analysis. His name is uh, Ricardo Vaz, and he's he's a white Mozambican. Uh, parents were involved in the liberation movement there on the side of the of, of Free Limo. Uh, grew up there, went to school in Germany, and midway through his like PhD was like, what on earth am I doing? <laughs> I got to leave, and I got I to gotta go to the Bolivarian Revolution. Like I've been reading about this for years. So he, he picked up his bags and, and just flew to Venezuela, and he's been there, I think, for four or five years. Uh, reporting on the grounds, kind of doing analysis of like what these social movements are doing, um, and it was really, really solid work. And I was touched. I'm like, do you don't hear stories like in Canada? The it, it, the <laughs> picture of immigration we have is like desperate people fleeing from abroad, settling here, and loving us, you know. And that's not true, right? Like people can leave the global north, go to the global south, and actually affect positive change, right? And just I see you were laughing at that. I think. Because I'm just picturing my partner listening to this part of the podcast, cringing, because often when I'm super <laughs> frustrated with Canadian politics and I have no ties to South America ex- except being drawn to the, the hopeful possibilities and, and history. And I that's it. We're going to Bolivia or <laughs> Venezuela or wherever I feel like, you know, I would be most effective in that moment. I probably just get in the way to be honest, but you know, and it's just laughter in response or don't be silly or this look of horror. Right. Like, and so, <laughs> but hearing Santiago, that hits a different note. You know, I could not imagine having those ties and feeling that pull. Like what I feel is completely different. And, um, yeah, it grows more of out of a frustration and completely different place than what you, you shared with us, Santiago. But Alex, what will you do with this knowledge? Um, I think after my field work, I hit a point where I'm like, academia is not for me. Um, this is like, yeah, these I, I can't just like have talked to, to, to these people doing these like great things to actually like affect positive social change. To, to even just survive with dignity um, and think of like being a professor is what I want, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm going to finish my dissertation, hopefully write and, and try my best to amplify these voices. Um, Sierra and Chris, who I mentioned earlier, they run a school, um, a podcast called Escuela de Cuadros. Um, and, it, you know, they do great work, for instance, and I've seen the way they do interviews. Like when you read like a scholarly books interviews, it's 90 percent of it is the, the words of the scholar. But when I read Sierra and Chris's work, they're not even, their voice isn't on the page. It's just quotes uh, from from people, just like these block quotes of like, this is what somebody said to me about like this topic, uh, about a factory seizure, about producing without the boss, um, about, um, you know, how a community goes about, um, you know, harvesting crops in a, in a democratic way. So there's, I really think there's a different way to, to do even like the intellectual work of activism. Um, and I'd like to explore that outside of the neoliberal academy, um, the, the shitbag that the, the university is today. Storytelling is just such a powerful way to relay that kind of knowledge and, and experience, right? As an alternative to traditional academic forms. <clears throat> but 
Thank you, Alex. I mean, like Santiago is true. We could sit on here for hours, but I feel like this was a more of a foundational for blueprints of disruption in terms of our first foray into drawing parallels with South America and drawing on that knowledge. So it, it certainly won't end there. We're going to be in touch because all I can think right now is a follow up with Productive Workers Army. I, I know a few people who speak like fluent English, so so definitely when 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 it's time, hit me up and, and I'll connect you to people. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes and I was like, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and and even without the English, yo hablo español, lo podemos hacer en, en español también para I'll pay for the English transcript. <laughs> <laughs> like I I I'm also down to do some work in another language, you know? And uh but no, that that would be amazing. That would be amazing. No, yeah, thank you guys for having me on. Yeah, I definitely have to pass on a bunch of resources, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. We'll be sure to share whatever you share with us in the show notes. So people who are listening and they want to know a little bit more, please check the show notes and we'll, you know, we'll link you through that. But like I said, you know, many more discussions to be had on, on this topic for sure. I, I'll have to pour through my notes and see how many tangents we can go on. Uh, <laughs> I, a whole mini series is brewing in my mind. And right. Santiago, I can exactly. just see the gears working and the grin tells me everything I need to know. And we should have recorded this visually. I think people would have had fun watching us get all giddy as Alex told those stories. Um, thank you so much, especially the way you relayed that with similar to the writers that you talked about um, by simply giving us the stories that you heard and allowing us to soak them up and take what we needed from them. Oh, definitely. You're welcome. Again, thank, this is turning into a Canadian stand -up. Thank you for having me on again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.